Hey there, and welcome to the Gap Year podcast. My name is Michelle Dittmer, and I am your host and Gap Year expert. Today, we are talking all things animals um, with the incredible Nora from Animal Experience International, uh, and she has so many little gems to share with us today. So welcome to the podcast, Nora. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle. It is excellent to be here. Wonderful. Um, so why don't you give us a little bit of your backstory because you don't get involved in animals in this way unless you love animals. So how did you end up where you are today? What was that backstory for us? Yeah, well, that is a great question because it gets me to talk about myself and I love talking about myself. Um, and also it is a, uh, a long story, but I'll make it short. Don't worry. Um, so yeah, I always loved animals and I always knew I didn't want to be a vet. And so <laughs> I knew I wanted to do something with animals and I had no idea what that looked like. I remember talking to my high school guidance counselor and they told me that I was really strong in Englishes and really strong in, um, in environmental studies. And so I should consider being a secretary. And I, I am, I'm not so old that, um, we even call them secretaries. They were still administrative assistants when I went to high school. And also that is not an animal job. And so, uh, I left going, I have no idea what I'm going to do. So I went to university. I went to Trent in Peterborough for environmental studies and anthropology, um, hoping that something would just jump out at me. I loved, um, thinking about how different people interact with each other in different cultures and um and you know all of us all all of us like animals around the world is what I also figured out in school and then um I went traveling after I graduated and I volunteered um in Central and then Southeast Asia um with a bunch of different groups a bunch of different programs but what really like made my heart come alive was I volunteered with dogs in Nepal and then elephants in Thailand so I got back to Canada and I was like, okay, how does this translate? I love doing hands-on work. I'm not a vet. What do I do? I became a volunteer coordinator at a wildlife center in Canada. And then a few years after that, my business partner said, hey, I have this idea to help people travel like you did and volunteer with animals. Um, I, uh, her name is Dr. Heather Reed. She is an amazing wildlife veterinarian. She said uh, that she can vet the programs for um, animal welfare. And why don't we help people travel? And I was like, yes. That is, that totally makes sense. I love tra travel. I love animals. I love people. That is what my high school guidance counselor should have said to me. Why did they not know about this company that didn't exist until we invented it? <laughs> well, I, think, I think that is, is, it's so accurate, right? Guidance counselors only know what they know. And so they try and put you in a box. I think sometimes um, they say your tests your test scores show this or your aptitudes are this and that tells us this direction um and sometimes we have to like shake our heads and go that that doesn't feel right I don't like that that is I that is not something that would light me up every day so I'm gonna carve my own path and that's really kind of what you did um as a side note though anybody who's heading into post-secondary should take anthropology courses um, I think it is one of the most underrated um, streams that exist and people just don't know anything about it. Uh, even with my biology chemistry degree, um, my anthro courses were some of my favorite courses. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I I totally agree. I, um, I just kind of like picked anthropology because, um, the course material, like one of the books had like a cool cover on it with all kinds of masks. And I was like, ah, I want to learn about that. And then I remember sitting in our very first lecture in anthropology and our, um, our prof said, you're all sitting in chairs and you're all looking at me. Why did you do that? And we all went, I don't, cause the chair is here. It's like, well, why did you sit in the chair? And we're like, cause chairs are for sitting. She's like, well, who told you that? And we all went, what? <laughs> okay. And so, yeah, it's so eye opening to learn about people around the world, but then learn so much about yourself and so much what you take for granted and, and what's happening in your culture. Yeah. Anthropomorphism at its finest. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Haven't said that word in a million years. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, but I think I think it also kind of shapes a lot of our understanding in the travel world or people who have been bitten by that travel bug. Um, there's so many there's so many things that we learn by observing, and it really also not only do we have the magnifying glass looking at other cultures, but that magnifying glass turns into a mirror, um, and you start looking at yourself and the the things that you just kind of do because you've always done it and and you start to question things and look at things in a different way and I think that's a skill and and it feeds really well into entrepreneurship as well where you you see an opportunity and then you fill that opportunity with a solution um, which is what, (laughs) what you guys did which is so fantastic. Oh, that's an excellent segue. Um, (laughs) But yeah, it's all about that storytelling, right? And seeing where you fit in the world and how other people fit there as well. So instead of you going, um, you know, in sort of the roots of anthropology and othering and, um, and us going to see how, how different people are, it's, well, how different are we to each other? And, and how do we all fit together? And in that mosaic and those masks on, on, on that book that I saw, how are all of them important and how are all of them from different cultures? They're all masks. They all use sort of the same pigment, the same paints, the same sort of folklores. How, how does that fit? And then, yeah, in, in entrepreneurship, the same thing. How do I fit in the world and, and how do I fit with everyone else and how can I help other people fit as well? Mm-hmm. And in your case, how do you stand out? Like nobody else has this focus like you guys do, which I think is just so brilliant, especially when we're looking at the world of animal lovers. Like there is a certain gene, I don't know, something in in inbred with people that they that they have this passion for animals and we all want to support them. And that is really something that you guys saw. So what do you think it is about volunteering with animals or supporting animals um, that that is so contagious or so um, so so thrilling that people want to get involved with that? Well, I, I think one of the things that, <clears throat> that that I think makes it so thrilling is oftentimes we are told no because you don't have a degree or no you don't have experience or no you've never um held a monkey before so of course you can't do that um and but with with the right guardrails and the right training and parameters and leadership around you you can you really can help animals um in in many many different ways so So I think what often happens is people, wherever they're from, if they see a sad, hurt, injured animal, they want to help, but then they go, but, but it's not for me. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help it. Or they watch a nature documentary and they go, oh my gosh, like the something's happening with the coral. Someone needs to help. Or, um, you know, there, there are polar bears there's, there's, there's any matter of sad things to talk about, but all of us are so action driven. We want to help or we want to go like, what, but what can I do? And like, and donating is, is very, very helpful is so good, but people want to do more. They want to have that tangible, actionable thing, and they want to have a memory of doing it. How oftentimes we donate and that helps and that's wonderful, but then we forget And then at tax time, we go like, what? I donated that? Okay, sure. But when we go away, when we get our hands dirty, when we are in experiential learning, these are memories that last forever. And so people go, they can, they can then look themselves in the mirror, look themselves in the face, I guess is the actual expression. Um, But they can tell their friends and they can look around them and say, ah, I have a place in this world. And I know that I do because I helped this monkey, dog, elephant, horse, things like that. It's just, you know, understanding the world a bit more and understanding that you can help and you can do something. I think just feels good. Yeah super empowering. Um, and I think that that goes across sectors, whether it's animals, uh, other people, um, causes that are particularly close to your heart. I think that, that we get endorphins released. We get those feel good hormones when we are supporting somebody else in that sustained, 
um, ability to help out like physically um, is so powerful. And I think those memories that you take home too, if we go loop it back again to storytelling, the, the stories that you get to tell afterwards also have a ripple effect because then people will understand some of the issues that these animals are facing um, or some of the other opportunities that are out there. So not only did you support through, through the actual physical work that you did, but those stories that you bring home might inspire somebody else to support either financially or get involved in some way. So you're actually magnifying the impact that you're having by, by telling stories and by having those memories for yourself. Absolutely. And having those stories of hope, right? Like we have a sea turtle center in Australia, which is amazing. And there is hands-on work with these sea turtles, but then you are, uh, you're living in and supported by the local community. And two of the uh, sea turtle conservation supported um, uh, activities is one uh, planting mangrove trees and the other is helping a recycling co-op that's run by women. And I just think that it is so amazing. And we often say that we trick people into <laughs> learning about themselves and learning about human rights issues. Uh, we trick them by saying, you're going to see a sea turtle and then saying, you're going to see a sea turtle, you're going to help it, and you're, un you're going to understand all the different intersections that sea turtle conservation is important to you, to the environment, to local men and women, um, and, and everyone. And so people come back and, you know, they tell those stories, like you said. They say, uh, people say, oh, what did you do with the sea turtles? And they have these making stories and they're like, but what's also equally incredible is there is this locally run women's co-op that does recycling with everything they find on the beach and with the whole municipality. And it was supported and it started by this center. And now these women are all through the pandemic, never lost their job, always were able to be breadwinners, always helping their families through recycling and through seed oil conservation. I think it's just so great. And again, like you don't have to be a vet. You don't have to be on track to do vetty stuff. Um, you can just go down and say, oh, sea turtles seem kind of neat. And then you learn about recycling and you're like, oh, I actually want to do more of this or I want to learn about micro loans or women's co-ops or, or everything else. I think that the story thread goes through so so many, uh, it gets woven into so many different patterns. It can be really interesting. Yeah. And, and the complexity of the world that we live in, you may, you may be brought in through this one vein, but you're actually going to be exposed to so many other issues and the interconnectedness of that, I think is also really humbling for us as human beings to realize mm -hmm. that there is so much more than that, that elephant that has been brought into captivity for tourists. Like, like the, the issues are so, so much, there, there's so many compounding factors that you get exposure <laughs> to and you discover other passions that you might never have known that you had um, and things that you want to pursue or things that make you curious or things you want to learn more about, which is um, really I don't know, part of my goal in living is how, how do I maintain curiosity? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what makes life exciting is, is always uh, asking what's next or what's different or, or how do I get involved and in having new op experiences and opportunities is a way to, to really bring that to life. But I want to, I want to loop back to, to what you kind of said a little while ago, you were, you were talking about volunteering, but having those guardrails um, mm -hmm. in place and some, some parameters, because I think when it comes to volunteering, when it comes to volunteering abroad, when it comes to volunteering with um, animals that don't necessarily have a voice, um, I think sometimes things can go awry. So what are some of those pitfalls and, and, and subsequent guardrails that, that, that exist um, when it comes to volunteering with animals? Yeah, well, you know, to start on a happy note, and then I'll get to a not so happy note, the one of the most empowering and wonderful parts of my job is every time I go somewhere, I am working in the local community with leaders who have 
who were helping these animals before I got there, who will help them when I'm there and help them when I leave. And so it's not about me being a white savior, coming in, changing everything. It's me saying, what are the leaders doing and how can, how can I help them? So we only go to places that contact us first and say, we are looking for help and this is what the help should look like. So we typically don't have professionals that come with us because there's already professionals on the ground. What we don't need to have vets. We need people that will support the work of these vets and can do work that anyone can do. Anyone can cut up a banana to help an orphan monkey. A vet doesn't need to do that, but I can do it. And I have a much better experience because of it. But so, so, so one of the guardrails is making sure that we're always working in the local community. I am just a conduit to help other people learn what everyone else is doing. I, uh, I have been to all of our programs and even more. And that means I have been to uh, more than 45 countries. And I like to tell people that I don't know anything. I just, nope, treat me like I am five. I've been to a lot of different places, but I have not been to this community yet. So what are your problems? What are your solutions? What can we help with? I think the other problem, unfortunately, is so we all, well, I didn't, I, I will not lie to you, Michelle. I did not watch Tiger King, but a number of other people did in this past while. And it really showed how people have, some people, a lot, have entitlement over animals. And this happens a lot in tourism as well, that people want to pay some money have an experience and then leave again. This happens a lot in volunteering. And this is one of the reasons um, I visit all the places first because I wanna make sure that everything is on the level and is has high standards of animal welfare. So I can go up to a worker and say, hey, can I maybe ride the elephant? And if they say, whoa, no, absolutely not. Why would you ask that? I can say, oh, perfect, tick. Um, because elephants don't want to be written and they shouldn't be written. And so we have to make sure that it's not about exploitation. We have something that we call consent-based volunteering that over, you know, we, we've been doing for the past 10 years, but we've been calling consent-based tourism um, for the last year because I made it up, but I really like it. Um, <laughs> and we look at it in sort of like a triangle that, Every, um, every being in the, in the interaction is consenting to it. And if they're not consenting, they can leave. So um, the local community is saying, yes, we do want you here, please come. They're not being coerced into it and saying like, oh, I guess we'll have volunteers. They're saying, no, no, come, come. The volunteer wants to be there. They want to have this interaction. They are given the tools, they are trained and they, um, again, they're not coerced and going, oh, I guess this is fine. They have the correct expectations of what they'll be doing. And then the animals also are consenting to it. So uh, they are not on tethers, they're not chained. If there is an enclosure they have to be in because it's uh, wildlife rehab and they need to be protected from people or people need to be protected from them, they can leave. They can go somewhere and hide or den or, you know, get away from the interaction that could happen. And so it's, you know, it's one of those things that we see people uh, uh, swimming with dolphins, riding elephants, putting slow lorises or monkeys on their shoulders for a picture. Every person thinks it's just one interaction. And yes, for you, that was your one and only interaction. But maybe in that day, that was a hundred people on the back of an elephant. That was a hundred people that swam with that dolphin that lives in a small tank. And so, you know, we, we look at the exploitation that happens through tourism and through the entitlement that people have over animals. And we say, there's a better way. And there's a way that we don't have to feel gross. Like we can help tigers, we can help dolphins, we can help wild horses, and we're not going to leave and tell these stories later on with an asterisk of being like, ah, it felt okay until I saw this happen. Everything is vetted so we can say it was amazing because all this happened. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's so important because there is, um, 
this glamour when it comes to animals. It is the sexy Instagram picture. It is the stuff that that um, that communicates out really well. Um, and and sometimes we don't recognize the 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 damage or the harm that's happening in the in the back end of that. So I think it's really important that if you really truly do care about these animals' well being, and this is something you want to be um, pursuing, or even if you're just a decent human being. Um, doing that research and, and looking for organizations like um, AEI that, that does that proper vetting, that, that makes sure that everybody is consenting, including the, um, the nonverbal beings that are there. <laughs> Um, I think that that's that's so essential and 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 not to be overlooked and not something to to fast forward through um, because I think we need to make sure that we we are doing our job and we are doing the best case and another thing that you said at the beginning in terms of like what should you be doing or what can you do if you're not a vet I love that example of cutting the the banana for the monkey um, because I think <clears throat> pardon me that that. Sometimes people think, well, oh, I'm, I want to be a vet, so I'm going to go and I'm going to be a vet somewhere where there are no vets. Um, <laughs> and that's just um, that's just silly. You you have no training. Why are they going to let you care for that animal without any training? I'm not going to let you do open heart surgery on me without a ton of degrees. So um, <laughs> why would we why would we subject animals to that too? So yeah, and like, what will happen when you leave? Like, if you want to do open heart surgery on a lion on the savanna that is problematic in itself, but you leave, what will happen to the hearts of all of those lions that you didn't operate on? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you do have to look around and have that self-awareness of like, wow, yeah, wouldn't it be so cool to be a vet and do that? But you'll have to pay your dues for a while and you'll have to become a vet, become a wildlife vet, spend a lot of time assisting, do a lot of residency. And like, you know, if, if, um, if, yeah, someone came up to you and said, oh, I think I can do open heart surgery on your cat. You would say, oh, no, 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 thank you. <laughs> and it's, you know, the exact same for all around the world. We have to, you know, look around and say, what, why do I think I can help with this? I remember I was on a program uh, a few years ago in Malawi and we were talking about veterinarians and just kind of a lot of stuff. And one of the vets there, so Malawi is in Southern Africa and uh, there was a vet from South Sudan and she shared that 150 veterinarians um, graduate from the vet program in South Sudan every single year. And there is one paid position in South Sudan. Wow. And a lot of that is because people are volunteering on short term programs and there just isn't like, why, why would you pay a vet if you have a whole bunch of volunteers that are coming through? It's not sustainable. It's not helpful. It does not build up a local community. And, and, you know, like I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to shame anyone, <laughs> but I, I want to shame some people, but I don't want to shame a lot of people. And like, we just don't know what we don't know. And so I do like, I love having these conversations and I love talking about animal ethics and travel ethics. And we have tons of that information on our website. And we do a lot of Instagram lives and just lots of content because like, I, like, again, I'll say it, like, we don't know what we don't know. And so people want to do the very best by these animals, by themselves, by the community. And they just haven't thought there's probably people here that are doing it. So I think, you know, I think it's my responsibility to say like, oh, no, no, this, this is a nice way of doing it. This is a helpful way of doing it. And then that also triggers in people's brains other, you know, like you said, being curious and saying, well, if that's not ethical, this probably isn't. And what can we do about this instead? Yeah. And I want to link this podcast and I'll do it in the show notes as well to a podcast that uh, we released just a little while ago with um, Claire Bennett, who is um, an incredible human being and the author of a, of a book called uh, learning service um, mm -hmm. and just an absolute powerhouse in ethical volunteer terrorism. Um, I'm just incredible. And in the conversation, one thing that really sticks out, and I'm going to say it again. So sorry if you've listened to that other episode too, but, um, 
we talked about how my understanding of things really shifted when we, we all know that the old adage, um, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach a man to fish, he'll, he'll, he'll have food for a lifetime. Well, uh, a mentor of mine said, well, take it one step further and ask them, do they even like fish? Like maybe they, don't, <laughs> maybe they don't even like fish. And then why are you teaching them to fish? Like that's, that's your role as a volunteer coming in. And Claire pointed out and she said, no, no, there's one step before that. And like, my mind just exploded. I said, what do you mean? There's one step before that. She said, think about it. Any civilization around the world that is located close to water, do you know any of them that do not already know how to fish? They have lived Mm -hmm. there for thousands of years. They know how it's done. Why do you think you know any better? Um, and, And why would you even come? Because they know how to catch fish way better than you do in their particular river or ocean or stream or whatever it is. And, um, and I just thought that that was such a handy way to put everything in perspective that, um, that, that there are those experts on the ground and, and that is not the role that we play coming into a community um, mm-hmm. that we, that we have a lot of humility. We have to take that, that dose of humility and be like, Oh, okay. What, what is the role that I play here? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that no. you so well. Oh, I, I love that. I am going to steal that immediately. Um, because yeah, so much of travel and so much of just life actually is just humility and saying, you know, just being thoughtful and kind with your interactions and saying, yes, you probably bring a lot to the table, but why don't you ask what people would like you to bring? Mm -hmm. And instead of showing off all these other probably wonderful things, just sitting there and saying, what do you need? Or what do you know? What do you want to tell me? Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's quite a few cultures that uh, I've, I've worked with communities that I've worked with that have uh, like a cultural idea um, that they won't answer your question. Cause if you're asking it, it means that you are not ready to hear it yet. And so you'll, you'll hear the answer in storytelling through other times. And so if you're like, why do we do this thing? No, 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 no. We do this thing because of that thing. And that thing happens because of something that happened before. So you have to already pay attention to things that are already going on. And I think it's just so interesting for us, especially, you know, people from the West that go somewhere and say, well, I know how to fish and I can fish effectively and efficiently. And I'm going to show you all these things so you can live like me. And people look at the West and they go, oh, do we really want to live like you? Actually, pretty happy living like me. Thank you, though. Yeah. 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 And the people that are hosting us are giving us true gifts. They're giving us the gift of working with um, orphaned mothers, baboons, and um, and we'll just say primates, antelope, and so many other things. Like we are, we're being hosted and given the opportunity to help. And I think that that is that is like such an amazing part of everyone's story to say, these are the people I met. These are the animals that I worked with. And this is how it continues to change my life. Yeah. I think it's, it's such a, such a beautiful thing. And I know that you guys offer a ton of um, like different diverse experiences. So what are some of the things that if people really feel connected to working with animals, what are some of the things that they might be able to experience through AEI? Yeah. I mean, I have not watched, I think I did say wild horses once, but one of the most amazing ones that I like bringing up is uh, volunteering with wild horses in Mongolia. Um, because the, the program is citizen science and you work with a hundred percent Mongolian scientists, you live in a yurt on the Mongolian step. I'm going to say Mongolian a hundred times. Um, and what you're doing is you are just collecting data points. And so uh, literally anyone can do it. You walk on the step and there are wild horses and you are just, um, you, uh, you write down where you saw the horse, the behavior, GPS coordinates, weather, things like that. Because as we know in science, more data 
means better science. And so if there's only three points of data every day from these scientists, then it's good. But if we have 20 volunteers and there's 23 pieces of data for two weeks um, for then three months, we have so much more and we can understand how to conserve these horses. So it's a very easy adventure. <laughs> you just go hiking every day. And then that translates to like better horse conservation in Mongolia, in this amazing place. But then we have also some, some really hands-on wildlife programs uh, to do wildlife rehabilitation in places like Malawi and Guatemala. And that is incredible because again, you don't have to have any experience. It is a lot of husbandry, feeding, cleaning, doing enrichment for the animals. You're always working on a team and you always have um, volunteer coordinators as well as team leaders. So there's never a time that you're put in a an enclosure with a jaguar and told go to town <laughs> you're always very safe it's the jaguar but... that will go to town in that situation <laughs> yeah, actually fair enough <laughs> and that would be fine <laughs> that's what they get but uh but i took my mom to guatemala a couple of years ago and on our very first day she cut up a bunch of food and then i got to bring her into the enclosure with uh two cans and she was able to put food out for like this um amazing charismatic weird bird that all of us like have seen before but whoever thinks that they would be able to like feed a toucan that is being rehabilitated so it can be released again it's pretty like so so special and then that program in Guatemala we take our volunteers to Tikal National Park after and so they're able to see um beautiful Mayan pyramids that are still used contemporarily by the uh, the Mayan people. And you get to see a bunch of wild animals in the wild. And so you work with these two pans when they're in an enclosure, they're getting healthy, and then you see them in the wild. And it's just like this holistic, just wonderful, like, ah, oh, okay, yeah, this is why we're doing it. It's not just sad animals, they're all so happy. Um, but then we also have like dog and cat programs in places like Nepal and uh, Kenya and Mexico for people like me that just love doggies. There's some spay neuter programs that again, anyone can work on. Uh, sometimes it, it, well, it's always helping vets, but sometimes it's helping uh, the vets do some like grooming of the dog. Sometimes it's enrichment. It really, it, the, the what the amazing part of going to all the programs first is knowing exactly who can help and how. Mm -hmm. So people say, I've always wanted to go to Nepal. I love doggies. I have zero experience ever working with dogs. I have one at home and that's it. And I can like create a program for them that they're safe. The vets are comfortable and the animals are like well loved and taken care of. So it's, it's pretty special to do that because some people will carry on with, uh, with uh, a career with animals. And some people will say, yeah, you know what? Like I love design and I love animals. So I'm going to continue with design and I will work animals in every now and then. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really cool. We have people that have all kinds of different backgrounds and just, you know, have this heart for animals. So I can say, sure, if you can sweep, you can go help an elephant. <laughs> Well, that's actually my one downfall. I am a terrible sweeper. So I will, <laughs> I will have to pick a different program for myself. Just <laughs> he, he thinks it's hilarious. He doesn't know how somebody so mechanical and like formulaic cannot figure out how to sweep the floor, but <laughs> that is a whole other podcast episode altogether. <laughs> <laughs> that's sweeping experience international. That'll be the next podcast. <laughs> coming, coming right up. <laughs> Well, Nara, this has been so enlightening and exciting. And I know there are so many animal lovers out there that have really connected with your message. Um, and now they know that you exist, which I think is really important. Um, but more important than just knowing you exist, how can they find you? Where can they find you? Where can they get more information about all of the amazing things that you shared with us today? Oh my gosh, well, flattery will get you everywhere. Um, <laughs> so we are Animal Experience International. Uh, I do like to joke that we are very Googleable. So if you forget what our name is, you can say, I wanna have like an experience with animals internationally. 
and you'll find us. Uh, we are on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we do a little bit of TikTok. Um, you will see that I'm an elder millennial because I have a side part in skinny jeans. Uh, and we are on LinkedIn as well. So um, anywhere you want to find us, we will poke up our heads and say, hey, let's talk about animal ethics. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Wonderful. Well, we will put all of the links to all of those places uh, in the show notes. So if you do want to connect with Nora and the folks at uh, Animal Experience International, we will make sure we'll make that as easy as possible for you. So Nora, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks so much, Michelle. It was so fun. 